see uh, you all again. Uh, I stated on last time, this is a beautiful concept. I, I commend you for getting up early, giving your mornings to the Lord, and uh, certainly to your preacher, Dr. Thomas, uh, one of my favorite, one of my absolute favorite teachers. I, our church loves him. The, the giftedness with which he can make the complex simple uh, is truly a gift from God. So I know you know how blessed you are, but it's just good to to see you all this morning again and to talk about marriage. I love talking about marriage because uh, it's the way that God uh, chose to uh, show us, to symbolize the relationship between Christ and the church, right? And so uh, I think that means to us that he takes it pretty seriously. And if he takes it pretty seriously, I think we should too. And so uh, I'm, I'm excited to spend uh, this morning and, and well, the next, the next three mornings uh, with you. And I hope you are as well. And, and listen, I want to say this too, before we get, before we get started, I'm just looking on the, on the uh, screen here. And I see, I want all of us to encourage one another. Uh, how many of you know marriage is difficult? Say amen when you can. <laughs> it's difficult. It's tough. Some of y'all probably got into it last night um, and possibly even this morning. But <laughs> but you but you made it here today. You made it here. You sitting across from each other. Uh, somebody ought to turn to the other one and just wink at them. Just just wink at them. Just just wink at them. Uh, somebody got to be the bigger person. Yeah, have you ever got? <laughs> <laughs> have you ever gotten have you ever gotten in a real silly argument and and neither one of you wants to be the first one to 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 break the ice to say I'm sorry to let it go sometimes it's just that simple just just let it go right so let's listen let's let's talk let's talk about let's talk about marriage I want to go back this morning to the beginning uh Genesis chapter 2 Genesis chapter 2 very familiar uh, story here, and I want to read it into your hearing first, and then we'll make a couple of applications, and then the morning will be yours. Genesis chapter 2, uh, verse number 18. Some of this will sound familiar from what we just read in Ephesians. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all of the cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. 
But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman. And he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall man leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Amen to the word of God. Um, for our time this, together this morning, I want to talk about a God-designed marriage. A God-designed marriage. It's often been suggested that the Christian family is a team. And this Christian family team is competing against Satan's team. And in the battle for the soul of the family, the Christian team needs to look up at the scoreboard and recognize that we're losing the game. Just look at the score. One out of every two marriages ends in divorce, whether they be Christian or not. Just look at the score. In many of our homes, the the television and the internet and social media are the primary caregivers for our children. Just look at the score. 14-year-olds can make bombs and babies but can't pass English class. Just look at the score. You got heterosexuals getting divorced while homosexuals are getting married. You got singles Talk to me here. You got singles having more sex than married people. All while the country is distracted by whatever Donald Trump is doing next. Think about it. Just, just look at the score. We need some help. Our team is losing the game to Satan's team. Each one of us needs to be keenly aware that the devil is not out to play with you. He's not out to befriend you. His job description, as it's listed, is to kill, steal, and destroy. This is not a game. Christian family is under attack. And, and Satan's attack on the family is not, it's not some new phenomenon. Uh, he started his attack way back in the garden with the first family. Adam and Eve disobeying God. A Cain got angry, killed his brother Abel. Satan is out to destroy our marriages, our children, and our homes. Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 12 says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness. So, so I wanted to look at marriage this morning and, and see how God designed it and defined it in the first place. <clears throat> I wanted to do that because you have... You have governing bodies state by state now trying to redefine marriage, but you cannot redefine what you did not create. Is that right? When we look at when we look at Genesis chapter two, we discover that God caused Adam to to go into a deep sleep. He took a, a rib out of him and then he sold the place back up again. That that sounds like. Uh, major surgery doesn't uh, he took out and sold up that that sounds like major surgery because that's what marriage is it's major surgery and i say that because too many people today keep treating marriage like it's some kind of outpatient procedure going in and out of marriages without sufficient pre-op treating it as if it was not something designed to be major in God's eyes. And so, and, and so family, I want us to look at this because marriage may have been made in heaven, but the maintenance of it has to be done on earth. Because when you, when you first get married, you're so in love that you think everything is ideal until you go through an ordeal 
when you go through an ordeal, you start to think you got a raw deal. <laughs> when you think you got a raw deal, then you start looking for a new deal. <laughs> so, so we need to look at this. Let, let's let's spend a few minutes today. Um, if we're going to if we're going to make it work, and if you're if you're going to not only obtain happiness but also maintain happiness, then I want to lift up just one of the many principles in this text that 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 teach us what God's design for marriage is. And that one point is this. God designed the two of you to become one. Now that's that's simple but complex at the same time. God designed the two of you to become one. When, when God hooks you up, his design was that the two of you are no longer the two of you, but the two of you are now one. The, the marital relationship is spiritual in that the Godhead and marriage are the only places that you can have more than one and they still equal one. Every, everywhere else, one plus one is two. But the Godhead, you know, one plus one plus one still equals one. Marriage, one plus one still equals one. So, so when it comes to marriage, this concept takes on several ideas. One is this. The first one is this. Since the two of you are one, then learn to keep everything and everybody else out of your marriage. God's design for marriage is between one woman and one man. Now, it, it may take a village to raise a child, and I believe that it does. I, I'm, a, I'm a village product and a village believer. But, but once that child is grown and gets married, the job of the village as it relates to their marriage is over. That's what this whole leaving and cleaving thing is all about in verse number in verse number 24, when God says leave and cleave, we know that that was inserted just for us because Adam and Eve were the first two people. So, so they had nobody to leave. God placed this here for you and I to grasp the concept that leaving and cleaving literally means to break your dependence. It means to cut the emotional umbilical cord. When you get married, no one other than God should then have first place in your life above your spouse. I hope you listened to me this morning. The, the almighty God is telling us that our partner should not have to compete with our parents. Your spouse should not have to compete with your siblings. Your friends aren't first anymore. Any other order is out of order because it puts too much pressure on the marriage. It, it makes a wife feel insecure and it makes a husband feel inadequate. Now, don't misunderstand me. It doesn't mean that that we we turn a deaf ear to our family or we disown our friends. That's not what I'm saying. But it means that we realize that we have our own family now. And while our families, extended families, are still a part of that and we're to honor our family, they are now just that. They are our extended family. And when your obligations and your loyalties to your then extended family take priority and precedence over your own family, your marriage is in serious trouble. The point is this. Don't give anybody outside a front row seat inside of your marriage. You know how you know how you can you can y'all can get into an argument and um and and and, and especially some of the older couples I, I I hope you can help bless some of the the young ones you can get into an argument and you can run home and tell your sister or tell whoever and you just because you're hurt you're caught in the moment but Couple of days later, y'all gonna be fine. And when y'all go, and when y'all go to mama's for dinner Sunday, they still gonna be looking at them crazy, right? Y'all have gotten over it, 
But now because you put them in it, now they looking at him funny, your, his sister looking at you. I mean, it's, like, it's, it's too much confusion. That's why we are to keep other people, amen, somebody, other folk out of our marriage. That, that's the problem that they had in this text. Satan got in their marriage. He interrupted their unity. He interrupted their com their communion and their happiness. I mean, just think about it. Before before Satan and sin entered into the picture, Adam and Eve had a perfect life, perfect home, perfect marriage. They didn't have a care in the world. They were just the Bible says running around the garden naked, eating berries, chilling. They would just have <laughs> they had, they they didn't have they had no work, no worries, no job, no no problem. Everything was perfect. But then Satan showed up. Satan shows up, says, hey, Eve, let me holler at you. And, and she let him in. And when anything from the outside gets into your relationship and starts to disrupt the unity that God gave you, that thing is of Satan. It wasn't. It wasn't long after her conversation with Satan that, that Eve was talking Adam into doing something that he knew God told him not to do. So first thing is this, don't let, don't let anything on the periphery take precedence. But then, but then secondly, make sure that you are in proper position as it relates to your purpose. Make sure that you are in proper position as it relates to your purpose. This problem came up in their marriage that we're all still paying for today because they both were out of position. I know they were. Eve, Eve was the command, the command to, to not eat of the fruit was not given to Eve. It was given to Adam. But, but obviously Adam told Eve what God said because she repeated a portion of the command to Satan. But when Satan told her something different, this woman didn't listen to God nor her husband. Eve decided that she wanted to be in charge. And so she made a manipulative status hungry move for power. Now, I know y'all don't have those problems up north. Y'all are too smart way up there. Y'all don't have those issues way up there, but down south, we we ain't that bright down. And, and so and so we we still have some sisters, beautiful, godly sisters that that want position that's not theirs given by God. They want to take over the marriage, take over, run the man and and do all of this stuff that God did not intend for the order to be. All right. And and if Eve wasn't bad enough, I got two problems with Adam in this text. I got a problem with his presence and I got a problem with his absence. Go back to Genesis. Uh, let's look at Genesis. Three, Genesis three. Because if you're like me, uh, when Satan, when Satan was talking to Eve. I wondered. Where was Adam when this snake was hitting on his woman? <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Where was Adam? And so I started reading verse, uh, uh, chapter three, verse number one. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said that you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. He, he's saying you can't really trust what God has said. Verse five. For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And watch this. This is where sin enters into the world. Verse number six. 
So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, lust of the flesh, that it was pleasant to the eyes, the lust of the eyes, and the tree was desirable to make one wise, the pride of life. Isn't that sin? Isn't that what he told us? That's all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. It all starts right here. She, she took of its fruit and she ate. But here it is. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. And when I read that, I said, with her? Come on, don't, don't tell me that Adam was standing there the whole time. Not, not the man, not the leader, not, not the, the one that God created to be in charge. He, he just stood there and watched Satan attack his family, attack his home, mess up his marital life. I got a problem with Adam physically being present and not doing anything. And okay, I know, I know, I know, again, y'all smarter than that up there, but I got some down here. I, I, I got some men that say, but I'm, but I'm here, ain't I? <laughs> well, the, the couch is there too, but the couch ain't doing nothing. You, you can, you can be there and not be there. It's your job, Adam, to lead the family. God holds you responsible. And I know I'm right about that because Eve did it. Eve took the fruit. Eve ate first. Eve gave it to Adam. But when God showed up, he did not say, I'm from Texas. He did not say, where are y'all? <laughs> he didn't say that. He said, Adam, where are you? Eve wasn't there when the command was given. So, so, so Adam, it might not be your fault but it's your responsibility. You are in charge. You are the leader. You are the one accountable. You're the one responsible. It costs to be the boss. I tell men here all the time, don't pull that, that I'm the head and I'm in charge and y'all be submissive to me if you're not willing to carry everything that comes with that. Everybody in my house carrying my name is my responsibility. If anybody is going to stay up at night worrying how we're going to keep a roof over our head, that's my job. If anybody is going to be the one that, that makes sure that this thing stays together, that's my job. I'm the man. I'm the one God put in charge. I'm the husband. I'm the, I'm the house band. I'm the, I'm the band that's there to keep the house together. Every time I read this, every time I read this, Dr. Thomas, I, I wanted there to be one more sentence where Adam says to her, no, woman, <laughs> I already told you, God said, don't eat it. And if God said it, then that settles it. Because I'm a Joshua 24 type of brother that, that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So I, I got a problem with his presence, but then, but then I got a problem Secondly, I got a problem with his absence. Um, go to chapter four. Let's look at chapter four. So chapter four, we know that this is where they, they start their family, right? And verse number one says that Adam knew Eve, his wife. Now it's early. We all grown on here. We know what the you know, Bible talking about when it says somebody about somebody knowing somebody. Okay. Um, and I'm, I'm just, we've been together a couple of times now. I'm just going to treat y'all like we family. All right. Uh, so, so he knew, he knew Eve. That's, that's verse number one. But when you keep reading chapter four, you don't see Adam. I don't see Adam in, in verse five. I don't see him in verse eight. I don't see him in verse 12. Still, anybody, if you see him, holler at me. I don't see him in verse 13. I don't see him in verse 17. I don't see him in verse 20. Anybody seen Adam yet? Where's Adam? Anybody know where Adam is? 
Oh, I see him again. Look, look at verse number 25. And Adam knew his wife again. Um, so my question for Adam is, where you been for a whole chapter in the life of your family? Where you been? Because don't tell me the only time you show up is when it's time to know somebody. Don't tell me the only time you show up, Adam, is in the bedroom. You got to show up for more than that. Your family needs you. You got to show up for the soccer game. You, you got to show up to the PTA meeting. You, you, you got to show up when it's time to, to do homework and, and somebody's struggling with an issue and they need a male perspective. They, they get the femininity from their mother. But, but, but when, what happens when they need the strength and the God-given guidance from their father? You got to show up for more than that. Because let me show you what happens when you don't show up. Go back to the beginning of chapter four. Uh, verse three, and in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And here it is. Cain was very angry. And his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you so angry? And why is your countenance falling? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not well, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you. But you should rule over it. Y'all, this was this was, I believe was because there was a son here who's who's going through a curve in life and his father either wasn't around or he was quiet and passive and just watched what was happening and let it go. So God starts asking questions here in verse number six that Adam should have been asking. Adam should have been there to say, Man, come here. What's wrong with you? What's going on? Why are you talking to your mother like that? Why, why are you treating your sister like that? Why are you acting like that at school? What's going on with you? And if he if he had been there, I just believe I, I, I know this is this is this is uh, uh, some eisegesis. And I hate to do this because of the kind of teacher that you have. But but I just believe that had he been there present, active in the life, this all of chapter four in his family's life, then then maybe some of this stuff wouldn't have gone down the way it went down. God needs men, the man, to stand up and be the man. There was this, there was this preacher who uh, was trying to finish his sermon late one night, and his little boy wanted to play. He was pulling at his, his pants and was trying to mess with him, play with him and stuff. And he, he was trying to get this word finished, though, because he, he, had, he had to preach Sunday morning. And so... Uh, he, he reached up and grabbed an encyclopedia and, and, and had there and he grabbed a picture. It was a picture of a, of a globe. And he grabbed it and just tore it up into several pieces and threw it down there and told his boy to put that together. Figured that'd take him a little while and he would and he'd be able to finish the sermon. But it wasn't but a couple of minutes later that the boy was pulling on him again, told him, he said, Dad, I got it finished. He said, how did you get that finished that fast? How did you know where to put? The Atlantic Ocean and, and Europe and Asia. How did you know how to do that? And the son told him, he said, well, dad, I, I turned it over. On the other side of the picture was a picture of a man. And so I just put the man together because I knew that if I got the man right. Then the world would be right. If I get the man right, everything else falls into place. So, so, so she's, 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 she's looking uh, for him all of chapter four. The, the kids are looking for him all of chapter four and Adam is nowhere to be found. So don't let, don't let anything outside get in. 
stay, uh, make sure we get into proper position. And then the last thing is this, and I'm done. Understand that for your marriage to work, then you're going to have to let some things go. Got to let some things go. God designed marriage for the two of you to come together as one. And that's a lot. That's a lot harder than it sounds because you're bringing two separate lives together into one. You're, you're bringing how you grew up and how you grew up and your experiences and your experiences and your friends and your friends. You're bringing your previous relationships. You're, you're bringing your families. You're bringing all of this together and, and now you have to become one. And when you do that and some friction takes place, you'll start to be like the children of Israel thinking that that things were better. You know, things were better back then across the river. Uh, and, and, and when we're doing that and we start to struggle. The grass always looks greener somewhere else, doesn't it? It just tends to always look better. We have mastered, especially us as church folk, we have mastered the art of coming to church. We could have been throwing plates and fighting all that morning, but we come to church Sunday morning, we're blessed and highly favored, aren't we? And and you can you can fool yourself into thinking that just because they're dressed alike this Sunday and they're smiling at each other that they got along all week long. And that's not the case. And so isolation causes us to think that we're the only ones going through something. Y'all, marriage is, is hard. And don't when it gets hard, don't start to think like those children of Israel that I need to I need to go back. Or the grass is greener because I promise you this. Somebody will take your hand and win with it. Somebody would gladly the stuff that you're complaining about and the stuff that you want to give up about. Somebody would. You don't know what other people are going through. Somebody would gladly take what you are complaining about. And turn into a winning hand. My encouragement to you is this. Just don't just don't throw in the towel. Don't don't take these temporary moments of struggle and think that that's it, that that's going to be forever. Truth is this, y'all, nothing, nothing can compare you. Nothing can prepare you uh, for those first three, four years of marriage. <laughs> Have I got a witness here? I remember. <laughs> You you trying to merge two lives together? Nothing can nothing can prepare you for that. My wife and I have been married now eighteen years, and those those first three or four, ooh we, ooh we. When I tell you, I mean, she would pack up. She packed up every <laughs> every two three months. She pack up all her stuff, and leave, and and wouldn't get two blocks down the road. You know, I, and I was silly too. I'd be helping her pack. Oh, you, get, you know, I mean, just silly, just being silly. Being silly and young, young and silly. And I'm just so glad that the Lord kept us, that the Lord sustained us, that the Lord gave us the presence of mind to know that it will not always be like this. Um, God took a, a rib out of Adam to make Eve. He, he took it from his, his side. Something had to come out of him in order for his relationship to work. And listen, there's some things that you may have to let go of in order for your relationship to work. Many of us, we have to let go of pride. Many of us have to learn how to say, I'm sorry. You know, that's, that's, that's tough for a whole lot of us to say. Many of us have to learn that we're not right all the time and that the way that our parents did it is not the only way to do it. And, and when you were single, there may have been some places that you went or some things that you did that your spouse may not like. You got to learn how to let go of some of that stuff. There may be some friends you had when you were single that your spouse doesn't want you hanging with anymore. And guess what? That's OK. That's OK. That's OK. We got to learn how to let go of some things. For our marriage to work, for our marriage to survive, there's some things that may have to come out of you. Oscar Robinson, one of the 50 greatest basketball players of all time, his 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 daughter had a kidney problem. And they told Oscar Robinson that your your daughter may not survive if she does not get 
this kidney situation taken care of. So what he did, he got on the operating table and he let them take it out of him and put it into her. And he did that because if he did not let that come out of him, his kidney come out of him and go into her, then the relationship with his daughter would not have survived. That's all I'm trying to tell you is that there are some things that we are going to have to let come out of us if we want our relationships, our marriages to survive. If we want God to be pleased with our marriage, there are some things. And only you know what that is. I'm not here to get in your business, but there are some things that you know God is trying to encourage you to let go of. Let me pray. God, we thank you for marriage. We thank you for this day, this church, this time you've allowed us to discuss and talk about marriage. Help us to know that we're not the only ones going through struggle and hard time. Help us to rely and depend on you, God. You, you love us. You gave us our spouse. You made marriage. You created marriage. God, help us to turn to you as the manufacturer to learn how to fix it. We love you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.